Good morning, Orange View. Psalm 69.30 says, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Do me, do me, joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Fields and forests, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Mortals join the mighty chorus, which the morning stars began. Father love is reigning o'er us, brother love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. Hey, good morning, everybody. So thanks so much for coming out to join us for our worship service today. We have a special week ahead of us. This is Thanksgiving, and there's certainly plenty of us uh, things that we can be thankful for. So remember, the scriptures tell us that all that is good comes from God. So if you just think on that for just a moment, think of all the good things that you have in your life. Uh, maybe even things that you take for granted, like air. Uh, everything that is good comes from God, and we can be thankful to the Lord for that. Um, I did want to tell you also that I generally believe that nobody should be spending Thanksgiving alone unless they want to. But you also may not have family or friends that you can spend that holiday with. So if you don't um, and you'd like to come and join our household, you're welcome to do so. So that is an open invitation to anyone that would like to do that. Let me know if you're going to join us. It's pretty normal for us to have 25 or so people over at our place, so that will be fine. Uh, I'm able to be a decent cook, I guess, and I enjoy doing it, so you are welcome to come. Also, I did want to let you know on the subject of Thanksgiving that there's one thing that this congregation can be thankful for, and that is a brand new newlywed couple, and that is uh, Joe and Katie, who are over here to my right. Uh, they were married last week. Uh, I'm a big fan of marriage, so I, that's just fantastic. So certainly good for that. And then I also wanted to give you thanks as a congregation for your work in the Operation Christmas Child that went on. We were able to put together 99 boxes that will go to needy children throughout the world. And that's just a great opportunity to show your love and care towards other people. So thank you so much as a congregation for that as well. So um, as we're kind of settling that, I wanted you to know that we do an awful lot of our uh, things here electronically these days. And so we have a number of things that we have available for you that you have access to. So first of all, if you're new or visiting with us today, we'd sure like to know. And if you would just text the word Orange View to 94000, what that will do is it will take you to a screen where you can give us some information to let us uh, know whatever you'd like to share about yourself and to let us know any prayer needs or things like that that you may have. And we'd be happy to pray with you about whatever you've got. We're not going to show up unexpectedly at your home, but we would like to be able to send you a note or card thanking you for being with us. So again, just text that one big word, Orange View, to 94000. We don't usually distribute broadly print bulletins anymore, but we do make one every week. One of the deacons here at our congregation does that, and it is a wonderful ministry, and we're thankful to have it. Um, if you have not received your electronic copy yet, but you want to, you can text OV Weekly to that 94,000 number, and that will provide you with a copy of that. We do have some print ones available. I'll give you some word on distribu distributing those here in just a little bit, too. Also, you can print 
or text the word OV COMCART to that same number, 94000. If you have any prayer needs that you'd like to pass along or information that you need to get into the church leadership in some way. So what we typically do is we take those prayer requests, we echo them out to the congregation as an opportunity for prayer, and then we'll keep you posted on kind of what it is that's going on with those as those happen. So we've had some members that were in the hospital here recently, so we were able to echo that out. And so, again, we encourage you to use that ministry both to share your needs as well as to pray for those needs as they come in. And then also a very, very big part of our congregation is helping people who are not right with God become right with God. So if you're exploring Christianity or you want some more information about it or you're saying, man, I'm ready to make a commitment to the Lord, then you can text the word OV, I'm ready, one big word, to that same 94,000 number. And that will give you some more information about why you'd want to become a Christian and how you go about doing that and to give you an opportunity to answer or ask any questions you might have. Now, we don't pass communion trays here either, so if you are here on the church campus today, you're going to need to have a little communion kit. It might look like the one that's there on the screen, got one right here, um, where you've got the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine in that. Or it may be in a little kit that's in a little baggie. If you need one of these and you didn't get one on your way in, there are some in the back of the auditorium as well as the entry point into the auditorium. But you're going to need this for our Lord's Supper service, which will take place here in about 15 minutes or so. So you'd want to excuse yourself to do that. Now, another thing that our church does that's really neat is um, we help a church that's in Honduras. So Honduras as a nation is one that's got a tremendous amount of poverty and such in it. And they did uh, recently do some renovation on their church facilities that were there. And the footage that's playing there on the screen is the church there in Honduras. That is their new facility that they have built. Um, They are appreciative to be able to have that. And, of course, we're appreciative to be able to help them with that. And as the church there grows and develops and continues ministering for the Lord, we have a very effective evangelistic outreach. The scriptures do tell us that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. So the fields are very full for them there. So they just wanted to let us know that uh, they appreciate the help that we provide to them and they have been able to subject of general announcement. We have a new Bible study that will be beginning this week um, related to Christian evidences. You call that subject apologetics. I'll give you some more information on it a little bit later. That's Tuesday evenings at 6.30. It's done online. But we start that this week. I think it'll be a wonderful experience for all who are able to join. And to just give one final plug for that before we get back into our service here. We are entering a time of the year where people who otherwise do not give much thought to their spiritual life begin thinking about their spiritual life. Some of those people may be complete unbelievers. Okay, So uh, the material that we'll be going through on our Tuesday evenings will help you to reach those people. So uh, again, I'll give you more information about that later. But let's go ahead now. We'll have our opening prayer, and then we'll jump back into our song service. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, we read, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to be here this morning. As was mentioned earlier, we're thankful for the newlywed couple, that you would be with them, watch over them. And as we enter this Thanksgiving week, let us look back and see all the things we're so thankful for, all the good blessings that come from you. And be with us today as we go through this worship service, the singing, the praying, and the word that's to be given to us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Why? Because he's given Jesus Christ his son. Do me give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks 
Because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the sick say, I am whole. Let the bound say, I am free because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. As we enter into this week of Thanksgiving, I'd like to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. It's always good to get together with friends and family and to count our many blessings, especially we, as those of us who are Christians that have. So I'd like to this morning sing through some of the things that I'm thankful for, and I know you'll be thankful for as well. I'm grateful and I'm thankful for the blessed assurance that I have in Christ. These things have been written to you, to, who, you, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that you may know we have blessed assurance in Christ. <clears throat> To me, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. I am grateful and thankful for the word of God. For heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The word of God is eternal. It's also living and active, and it is powerful, and it speaks to you and me and guides us along the way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a path, uh, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So... Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way. Still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. I am grateful and thankful that I am a child of God. 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And you know, when I have a problem, you know who I turn to? My help comes from the creator of heaven and earth, my heavenly father. No, so who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am grateful and thankful for the living hope that I have in Christ. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar high with wings like eels. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The bottom line is, if God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, so how great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of king calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. 
I'm grateful and beyond thankful for the cross. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, this one is difficult for me. God Almighty, King of glory, took the form of a human and died the horrific death on a cross for me. That's hard for me to comprehend. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Thank you for the cross. No, so me. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the I'm grateful and thankful for God's amazing love. This is the, my last point, because this song service could have went on for days. All the things that I'm thankful for and could sing through. But if I had to choose one thing to be thankful for, it would be this. His indescribable love for you and me, because it kind of ties everything together. The cross, our competence in Christ. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And now while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I like this quote from Billy Graham. He says, God proved his love on the cross when Christ hung and bled and died. It was God saying to the world, I love you. Of course, God did tell us that in John 3, 16. For God so loves the world, you and me, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. How incredibly deep is the Father's love for us. Oh, how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring men, the sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His 
dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. The entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 gives us the well-known discourse on love. There we find a um, famous passage that if I had all the faith so as to remove mountains but did not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. And also in, in that chapter, uh, we can read, love is patience, love is kind, and it is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And Paul concludes the chapter with, uh, but now abide in faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of all is love. And it's very common to hear these passages during a wedding, but I would like to just quickly apply these passages of faith, hope, and love uh, to the context of Christ's death and resurrection. Christ, his voluntary death and resurrection gives us faith that we will be raised from the dead as well as him. Romans 6, verse 6 through 9 says, Knowing that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he has died, he who has died is free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. And just like that, uh, that strengthens our faith, Christ's death and resurrection also gives us hope for eternal life in heaven with God. Titus 3, 7 said, being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And Romans 8, 24 and 25 says, for in hope we have been saved, but we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we eagerly await for it. And finally, God's demonstration, God's death and resurrection demonstrates his love for us. Uh, as we just read, Romans 5, 6 and through 8 says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So now let's partake of the Lord's Supper where we remember Christ's death and sacrifice and resurrection. Take our packets and take out the bread and let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your son who came to this earth and loved us so much that he sacrificed his life for us so that we might have eternal life. 
Let's remember these things as we partake of this bread, which represents his body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then we'll take out the cup. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your son who shed his blood blood on our behalf, his blood that washes away our sins. Please help us to focus on these things as we partake of this fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So guys, that brings us to the point of our service where in just a moment, we're going to have a brief break. We'll have a five minute timer that'll count down for us. And one of the things that routinely happens during this time is we meet and greet our visitors. So don't be surprised if you're visiting with us, if someone comes over and says hello and thanks you for coming out to be with us. Now, also during this period of time, I distribute the print bulletin, okay? So if you uh, did not get an electronic copy or you uh, would just prefer to have a paper one, I do have some of those here that we print up each day. So I'll be up here in the front distributing those. So if you want one of those, just wander on up and get one. Uh, You could also get the electronic one by texting OV Weekly to that 94,000 number. Uh, another thing I distribute when I'm up here is the Kids Pack. Now, the Kids Pack is a uh, educational packet that's designed to teach the sermon material to the younger element of the congregation. So there's crossword puzzles and word searches and, and coloring and things like that. And again, they're specific to the sermon content each week. So if you'd like one of those, wander on up here and retrieve that. And then this also does give you an opportunity to send a note or card to anyone here within the congregation that you might want to do. So in the lobby area, we have the ability to send those cards. We've got a whole bunch of them that are available for you for birthday visits or get well or just thinking about you or sympathy or whatever it might be. And if you want to send one of those to a member of the congregation, just fill out the content that you'd like to write on the card, seal that thing up and put the member's name on it and then throw it in that little slot that says outgoing mail. And then what we'll do is we'll retrieve that, put the rest of the address on it, put the stamp on it, take care of it for you. So the only thing you need to do is essentially write the card and we'll take it from there. So you have the opportunity to do that during our break period as well. And then lastly, I will tell you that you also have the ability at this point now to explore more of that, hey, what's it uh, mean to become a child of God? So you could text OV, I'm ready to that 94,000 number, mention it to any member here. Any member here can help you with that. You can say, hey, I'd like to know more about becoming a Christian. And then, of course, I'll be up here in the front, too. You can come up and tap me on the shoulder and say, okay, I'm game. Tell me. And then uh, we'll talk. But I'll go ahead now and we'll start our timer. If you want any of those things that I mentioned, come on up here and get them from you. Otherwise, I'll see you all back in five minutes. Thanks a bunch. Skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see when my Lord is living in me. I know that Jesus is as well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that. I live for each day. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the beauty that surrounds me, it make me awake. 
it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never The skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises, grand. Sing and be happy, press on. To the goal, trust him who leads you. He will keep your soul wet. All be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing, be happy today. Often troubled in heart, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with early gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark does vanish away, then you are truly can sing. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal, trust him. Who leads you be will keep your soul let all be faithful look to him and pray lift your voice and praise in song sing be happy today off we fail and see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky when it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold if we hope and trust each day we shall have letters untold sing and be happy press on to the goal trust him who leads you he will keep your soul let all be faithful look to him and pray lift your voice and praise him in song sing be happy today so guys, again, this is uh, Thanksgiving week, and as a result of Thanksgiving week, we have a message today that hopes to focus our hearts in on gratitude. I'd like to read a passage to you out of Philippians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul speaks on this very subject. He said, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have now to, to worship you together here as brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we, we focus our thoughts right now on our uh, gratitude towards you for the things that you've bestowed upon us, we pray that our hearts would be in tune with your will for us in our life, that we would never be uh, take for granted the things that you have provided to us, that like the Apostle Paul says here, that we too would be content and that we would always be thankful. We thank you again for all your love and care. In Christ's name, amen. Well, it is holiday season, so Thanksgiving is just a few days away. Um, I always find it interesting that at this time of the year, we take two holidays that are really, really close together, one of which talks about being thankful for what you have, followed up by Christmas, which is a somewhat materialistic holiday that focuses on what you don't. Um, so we combine those two holidays together, and there's a little bit of oddity to it, but what I want to do is spend some time, like I said, today taking a look at this subject about being content. Okay, what is it that makes a person content? Well, on the screen is a book written by a guy named Michael Lewis called The New New Thing. 
And in his book, he talks about a gentleman by the name of Jim Clark, who up in Silicon Valley built not one, not two, but three businesses that he sold for over a billion dollars. Now, when the interviewer was asking him his questions, he was finding out whether or not he had, was content. You know, hey, you've crossed the financial finish line for most people. Are you now content? And the answer was that although he was extraordinarily wealthy, he was not a very contented man. And so the author kind of mocks him about that. And he says, I remember when you said if you had $10 million, you'd be happy. And then you said if you had $100 million, you'd be happy. And then you said, if you were an after-tax billionaire, then you would be happy. And then he says this in his book. Well, he's got it. Jim Clark has more than a billion dollars now after tax. He is not happy. Now, that's a very interesting thing. Uh, here's a guy who's got more wealth than anyone could possibly ever use in his whole life. And he still says, I'm not happy and he's not content. Unless you think that that's only something that happens to the uh, uber wealthy or the extremely poor, let me tell you that that disease of discontent affects every demographic and economic strata in our country. And what ends up happening is that people who are never thankful for what they already have will surely only be unhappy about what they don't have. And as a result of that, they end up in a very frustrated life. So the Apostle Paul said, I have learned to be content. And that's something that God would want all of his people to be aware of. Uh, there's this game, it was really, really popular in the 80s, Trivial Pursuit. It's kind of an interesting game. It deals, of course, with trivia, imagine that. And it's kind of a fun game to play for a little while, but eventually you become kind of tired of it as you realize that it's, well, trivial. Um, there's a historical figure by the name of Viktor Frankl, who, he was a Holocaust survivor. He wrote about the Holocaust and the things that happened there, wrote a book that kind of addressed that subject. The title of his book was Man's Search for Meaning. And in his book, one of the things that he points out is that people can tolerate almost anything as long as there's a purpose for it. If there's a reason for it, they can endure it. But one of the things the Nazis did during the Holocaust is they would assign the Jewish people to do meaningless tasks such as to move a pile of rocks from one side of the courtyard to the other. Day after day, week after week, year after year. And what that did is it robbed the people of any kind of meaning. Viktor Frankl said that people can survive any how as long as there is a why. Now when we live life, it kind of works the same way. As we go through life, we can endure an awful lot as long as we understand the purpose or the why. What happens to people who go through life as kind of a godless existence is they struggle to find the why. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the, the preacher there writes about that. This is the book that says over and over, all is vanity. All is vanity and striving after the wind. Like Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 22. What is man have? Or what has man for all of his labor? For the striving of his heart that he's toiled under the sun. What's the payoff for all of man's work? All his days are sorrowful. His work is burdensome. Even at his night, his heart takes no rest. And this too is vanity. When he starts off the book in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes, he talks about all the various things that he does to try and find some kind of purpose or meaning in life. He says, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, you always want more. The ear is not satisfied or filled with hearing, again, there's always something more. And then he goes through a list of all kinds of things that he tried to find meaning in life for and found it all to be empty. The pursuit of wealth and, and power and pleasures and everything else a person can strive after. He tried it all and said, I've traveled that road as far as it will go, and it only comes to a dead end. Well, let's fast forward to today. I would go out on a limb here and guess that even within this room, there's a lot of discontent. 
And what I base that on is just the reality of talking to people throughout the days. And as I talk to various people, I find a lot of people are, in fact, discontent. Here's one way you can know that you're discontent. There's a direct correlation between complaining and contentment. The more a person complains, the less content they are. So think about this. Over the last six months, I probably don't even have to give you six months. I could probably just say over the last month. Think about your life and whether or not you've complained about anything. And I'll give you some common areas. In the last six months or so, have you complained about your appearance, your health, your education, your athletic abilities, your achievements or lack thereof, your finances or lack thereof, how busy you are. Maybe you've complained about your spouse or lack thereof or children or lack thereof. Maybe you've complained about your boss or your work or the weather or the traffic or the construction on the freeway or that there's not an in and out burger closer to your house or whatever. <laughs> Just think about that. Have you complained about any of those things in the last six months? Probably so, which makes us all a bunch of grumbling people. And so if we're all a bunch of grumbling people, then how does that get us to where God wants us to be? We have to learn to be content. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And the things that he was speaking about were things like food and clothing and shelter and things like that. And apart from seeking first the kingdom of God, your life will be a trivial pursuit. Discontent's a big theme in the Bible. In fact, you don't even have to go far. The, the fall in the Garden of Eden was probably based on discontent, as Eve was convinced that God was holding out on her. But if you look to the Jewish people in the Exodus account, you can really see this. You remember the Jewish people spent about 400 years in Egyptian bondage. And the thing that they really, really, really wanted more than anything else was just to be free. They dreamed of liberty and freedom. And then one day God brought forth the miracle. He intervened and the people were set free. And you would think that the people would then be happy and eternally grateful. But they weren't. As they left Egypt, the first thing that they in the scripture complained about was the water. They said, the water's bitter. So God gave them sweet water. And then the people complained about the food. And as they complained about the food, then God provided them with a solution for that. Look at what they said in Exodus chapter 13. The children of Israel said, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots full of meat and we ate bread to the full, and yet you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. That was one month after they left Egypt. They didn't even make it one month before they complain and essentially wish that they had died in slavery in Egypt. So God intervened and he rained down from heaven, literally giving them bread from heaven, manna. And so in Numbers chapter 11, God describes the manna. And the manna was there like coriander seed. And the people would get it and they would take it. And it tasted like pastry prepared with oil. And by all accounts, it was a very, very versatile thing that they could do all kinds of things with. And so God is feeding them directly from heaven. And all they got to do is go out and pick it up and they've got it. And yet in response to this, we are told in Numbers 11 and verse 4, that the mixed multitude who were among the people yielded to intense cravings and they wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? And now they gripe about the manna. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. And now our whole being is dried up because all we have is this manna that God has given us directly from heaven. 
And the thing about being discontent and complaining, it's a bit contagious. Because even Moses gets in on the act. And Moses says this in Numbers 11 and verse 14. I'm not able to bear these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you're going to treat me like this, kill me here and now. Everybody wants to die. With God directly caring for them. So God intervenes again. But this time he kind of mixes mercy together with judgment. And he does give them their meat, but not really the way that they wanted. The passage goes on in verse 18 to say, okay, I will give you meat. And you will eat the meat. You will eat not one day or two days or five days or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and is loathsome to you. And there we learn an important lesson. Getting what you want does not bring contentment to an unsatisfied life. It's true. This is why people can go their whole life accumulating things that never bring satisfaction and contentment. This is how a guy who has billions of dollars can say he is unhappy. Having stuff does not bring contentment. It's amazing to me how serious and destructive discontent is. In 1 Corinthians 10, looking back at that era of the Exodus, Paul says, we shouldn't be like them. Don't be like them. He says, don't be like him and don't lust after evil things like they did. And don't commit adultery or idolatry like they did. And don't commit sexual immorality like they did. And don't tempt Christ like some of them did. And then this, and don't complain like some of them did. Notice the company that complaining keeps. Lust, sexual immorality, Tempting Christ and then complaining. See, it's a much more serious event than people think. Robert Hughes is an art critic, said this. He said, we live in a culture where people feel entitled to have all of their desires fulfilled. And I'll take it a step further and tell you, when you don't, you characterize yourself as a victim. That's our society. I can help you figure out whether you've got this or not. There's some signs of discontent that are fairly easy to diagnose. See if these are true with you. I find myself bored or dissatisfied in my work. I'm disappointed in my relationships. I become preoccupied as to whether or not I'm truly happy. I try to escape my discontent through whatever means I can, whether that be drug use or alcohol use or whatever. I lose my spirit of generosity. My initial response to events tends to be a bit on the cynical side. And then maybe the clearest of all, I grow resentful for those whose circumstances seem more pleasant than mine. In other words, I'm really unhappy when other people are happy. That's a major indicator of discontent. One author put it this way. The main emotion of the average adult American who has had all of the advantages of wealth and education and culture is disappointment. That's it. That's the way we tend to be. So how do you deal with it? Eh, you got a couple choices. Some people choose to just complain about it all the time. Other people go constantly looking for the next thing to see if that will do it. The next release of the iPhone, the next release of the computer, the next release of whatever. And then some people find it where it's only going to be found, which is with the Lord. Isaiah, um, speaking to the people of his day, said, Everyone who thirsts, come to the water. You have no money, come and buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money on things that is not bread? Why do you spend your wages on things that will not satisfy? Just come to me and let your soul delight itself in abundance. The Lord will be there for you. And thus we find really the key to contentment. Living in the love and care of God. This is why Christian people can be content. And worldly people who have billions cannot. Jesus said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. Whoever hungers... Let him come to me, and he will no longer hunger. 
This is where contentment can be found. This is where we can find the real deal. So, again, we're entering into a holiday where, where we should be thankful. And I hope that you are. And I hope that you resist the urge to be materialistic for the next holiday that comes after. In 1 Thessalonians 5, the Thessalonian writer says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I want to kind of close up our time with this by helping you just a little bit to appreciate this. It's good to be thankful. Parents want to teach their kids to be thankful, right? So, so every time a kid receives something good, the parent always asks the prodding question, what do you say? I love this story. The little boy was crying because his mom wouldn't buy him an orange at the farmer's market. And he really, really wanted an orange, and he's crying out for that orange. And then one of the men who was working at the farmer's market saw that little crying boy crying out for an orange, and that man decided to give the little boy an orange. And his mom said, what do you say? And the little boy handed it back and said, peel it. <laughs> Not quite what she had in mind. Let's make sure we don't do that to God. As he gives us our blessings, and we complain about what it is that we have. I want to suggest to you that material items will never be the greatest thing you have anyway. I read a study this last week. I thought it was fascinating. The author said that he challenges people to think back over the last 12 months of their life and then answer this question. What was the most impactful experience you had in your life over the last 12 months? You think about that for your own self. If I think back over the last 12 months, what was the most memorable or impacting experience I had in the last 12 months. In almost every instance, the answer involves a person. It's almost always relational. Almost always. And that just puts kind of a little bit of spin on the reality that the best things in life are in fact not things. They're people or relationships. And the thing about people, I'll warn you, is that we're not perfect. So people in relationships oftentimes do fail to live up to our expectations. But that's still where you're going to find a lot more satisfaction. So as the holiday season goes around, you might want to put your focus more on the relationships with people as opposed to the material aspect of that. And the greatest relationship of all you can have is with the Lord. Thus, the greatest thing I can encourage you to do is to develop that relationship with God more fully. And if you've never begun it in the first place, to begin it now. Because that's where you're going to find genuine satisfaction and contentment. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for, again, our time here in the scripture this morning as we've gone through and taken a look at your teachings concerning thankfulness and gratitude and contentment. And we pray, Lord, that we would truly be, as with the Apostle Paul, learning to be content, to recognize that all that we have is from you and to be thankful for that, to be appreciative of that. And we pray, Lord, that we would accept the blessings that you've provided to us and learn again to be content in the good and in the bad, in times of plenty and in times of need. We thank you for the love that's shown to us through the gift of Christ into this world who makes our relationship with you possible in the first place. And we pray that that above all else we would be most appreciative of. We thank you for the daily blessings we receive, the daily care that you provide, and the reality of knowing that you're always with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, let the God of my salvation be
head out of the auditorium, I do want to give the guidance concerning our another act of worship, which is giving. So the scripture tells us that God loves a, a cheerful giver, and so we certainly have ways to do that, but we don't do that by passing trays or collection plates. So the way that we can go about doing that are multiple. So one is you can give online, and you can go to the congregation's webpage at www.followthebible.com. When you do, just scroll down to the front very first page there, there's a big green button that says click here for online giving. And then what you would want to do is just click there for online giving. If you'd like to do that by text message, that's possible as well. You just text the word give to the number on the screen, which is 714-450-7010. And that will also enable you to give electronically. If you want to give by mail, that's possible also. The church's address is on the screen there, and that's 13211 Fairview Street, Garden Grove, California, uh, 92843. And then if you're here on the campus today, you can give tangibly at any of the exit points. We have little collection boxes that you can use there as well. And then also, again, if you are new or visiting with us today, we'd sure like to know. And so we'd appreciate it if you'd text the word Orange View, one big word, to that 94,000 number so that you can introduce yourself to us. We will be able to introduce ourselves to you, and we'd appreciate the opportunity to do that. Now, as we get ready to go into the week ahead, um, we have some opportunities for Bible study as well. So I just want to make a comment about this and show you a brief video clip about it's one minute long about our midweek study that we'll be doing on Tuesday evening. Now, our Tuesday morning study uh, meets here at the church campus, and we're doing a study through the Gospel of Matthew right now. And you're certainly welcome to join us for that. That's Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock here. And then after we are done with that, about 11 or so, we go out and grab lunch together. It's a good experience for us. But the one that is certainly going to be accessible to most of us, including our at-home viewers and streamers, is our Tuesday evening study, because we do that one online. Um, now, what we're going to be doing as we move through the final quarter of the year here, through the rest of the year, is we're going to be studying on Christian apologetics, which is, just means defense. We're doing a study called, Is God Real? And the first launch of that will be this Tuesday evening at 6.30 online, where we'll watch about 45 minutes of a movie called The Atheist Delusion. It's a fascinating video. What the author does is he goes around and he talks and interviews people who are self-admitted atheists. And he, he talks to them about the nature of their belief and how they've come to that conclusion. And over the course of his discussion, nearly every time the atheist recants their atheist position and admits there is a God. They may not necessarily know who that God is, but they at least come to that position. So uh, let me show you a one-minute segment of that, and then after we'll, we'll come back and we'll have our closing prayer. That religion is just absolutely uncalled for. We are we are just mere things floating on a rock in space. Believing in God makes no sense. It, it's to, to me, it's the dumbest thing. We are not only figuratively, but literally. Stardust. Are you an atheist? I am. So you're an atheist? Yes. Yes. I am. I need to know what to believe in. Like what happens when you die? Yes, I don't want to be a bag of dust. Did you know that 54 million people die every year? People just like you and me who love life. If you were shown evidence, you would change your mind because you're open. Absolutely. I think I am open to evidence. It just would have to be extraordinarily compelling, like out of this world compelling. Has this made you think today? It definitely has. I'll definitely consider this eye-opening. Wow. I hope I get enough guts to get myself out of this stinking plan. You gonna kill yourself? Yeah, I'd like to. Can you see what you're doing? Yeah. I'm lying to myself. I'll send the email out again, and you can get the information also on the webpage for the congregation at followthebible.com. So, uh, very last comment. Remember, chief mission of our congregation is to help other people who are not right with God become right with God. 
If you've got unbelievers in your life, join us again for our study. I think it'll help you with that. Another thing that you can do if you are that person is text OV I'm ready to that 94,000 number. That'll help us to provide you with some information about what Christianity is, why you'd want to consider it, and how a person becomes a child of God. But let's go ahead now and we'll close up with our closing prayer and we'll be all done for the day. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today together, united in constant thanks and in constant praise. There is no God like you, there is no king to match your glory, and we praise you in your name, your grace, and your love. We are thankful for your care, the lives you've gifted us all with, and we acknowledge that we are not only privileged just to know you, but to have the ability to come here each week and celebrate your love and your sacrifice. We have each and all of us made countless mistakes, mishaps, and wrongdoings, yet you love us all the same. We do not deserve your love, we do not deserve your grace, but you present it nonetheless, and for this, we are thankful. As we head into the new week, as we share our time with our families and our loved ones, we ask that you please be with us in our travels and the travels of our loved ones, and we ask that you be with us throughout the week. We thank you for your blessings, your comfort, your care, and as we celebrate the holiday this week, that we will keep you in our mind and our hearts, and make sure that we share you with as many people as we can on this day of reunion. We pray all this in your son's glorious name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. Have a joyous week.